We need to talk about food. If you're new here, I do this series called The 20s Toolkit, where I talk about things I learnt in my 20s. And to be honest, it's a scandal that I haven't covered food yet. I ate it every single day of my 20s. It's the reason I could stay alive to do my 20s it deserves its own video. Your 20s is the first time you really left your own devices to work food out on your own. And it wasn't long until I realized feeding yourself effort. And I soon realized there were lots of assumptions that I had about food that if I was going to survive until 30, I would have to start unpicking. There are so many, but here are 10. First one that blew my mind, this is not a ripe banana. I often wondered why when I ate bananas like this, I felt a little bit uncomfortable and kind of stodgy here. Like my body was really struggling to digest it. Apparently that's totally normal. You might not have attributed your discomfort or indigestion to eating a banana that looks like this, but a banana that looks like this isn't ripe. It can cause bloating and gas due to a higher resistant starch content. Ugh. Gross. I didn't really realised till I got to uni that people thought that bananas that have spots on them must be going off. Black spots and softness mean that it's getting ripe. Ooh, steady. It doesn't want to be eaten, it's like, mummy, don't, please, no! You kind of have to buy them unripe in the supermarket, you have to wait for them to ripen. This one's kind of ripe, I'll probably eat it tomorrow or the day after. If you're impatient and you want to eat your bananas straight away, you can always pop them in a paper bag or a plastic bag with some holes. Just speeding up the ripening process. Because then you won't get a stomachache and also they have a higher level of antioxidants when they're ripe so don't body shame the banana spots don't mean rotten they mean ready flour is a thing you buy incorrect <laughs> flour is just ground up anything <clears throat> more formally it is <clears throat> a powder obtained by grinding grain typically wheat if you're not really into wheat your body doesn't like it or i don't know you're in a global pandemic and every fucker's decided they want to make sourdough at home and there's no flour in the supermarkets with a hand blender you can pretty easily make your own during the pandemic and there were lots of scary empty shelves in my supermarket i realized that Nobody had bought the porridge oats. So I popped my oats in a bowl, used a hand blender, tried not to spray the oats everywhere, and Heath Robinson that shit. Speaking of flour, the next myth, bread is hard. I always thought it was like, making basic meals, occasionally making suspect biscuits for your friend's birthday, being able to make bread. Mm -mm -mm. Bread's one of the most basic functions of our diet and we can get really overcharged for it. I don't like make my bread all the time, like don't get me wrong. But this stuff has a lot of weird shit in it that I didn't realise. Spirit vinegar, loads of preservatives, caramelised sugar, I'm not, I shit you not. Vegetable oil, which I recently realized is way worse for you than saturated fat. So when I realized how easy it was to make your own bread, I was kind of a little bit outraged. Jack Monroe has a really simple recipe that I'll link, but I actually discovered it because I was reading this book, Midnight Chicken. The part of making bread that I thought would be super hard is it being raised, like helping it rise. Um, but turns out, you don't even need to do that to make bread and it cooks in like 25 minutes. Jubilated and also outraged. Also, buttermilk, very hard to find, but realise that if you just wax some kind of natural acidic juice, like lime or lemon, into some normal milk, or even some soy milk I used for this one, it works totally fine. takes years to have a new diet. When I was reading more about the climate and food at the beginning of this year, I was really daunted by the idea of cutting out meat and dairy products in my life. But actually studies show that most of us cook just nine meals on rotation and that is very generous for me. I think I probably cook about four meals on rotation. So if you want to try and go vegetarian or vegan at home, it might not be the case of just cutting out a whole food group from your diet, but learning one meal at a time and putting it into your little repertoire. That's what I've been trying to do and I've realised that's way more in tune with how my brain actually works and means that I'm not constantly having a brain freeze just trying to at the last minute adapt default meals I used to cook. 
It's all of our dirty secret, even though we've got this beautiful line of recipe books in our kitchen. Nine. Nine. At best. When you grow up, you have to eat grown up meals. False, 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 false. My lockdown meals have been progressively more childish to the point where I cooked this Mr. Twit face uh, the other day and ate the whole thing and nobody can deny me a mortgage or stop me from buying fancy tea lights just because sometimes I like animal shaped spaghetti hoops. If you've got a craving for nachos, fucking fly. Sorry, a murder just occurred. This is some high London rent here. I'm not gonna let a fly live here for free. If you have a craving for nachos, you're gonna have to wait to go to the shop to buy some nachos. I learned this at uni, uh, but it's also been very useful in lockdown when I haven't been able to go to the shop. All you're gonna need is some Tesco value lasagna sheets. Watch and learn, watch and learn. Also really good for stress. Fuck you, Boris Johnson. Putting bloody mandatory calorie counts on menus. There's no nutritional science to link calorie content with long-term health. Tiny bit of salt. You genuinely don't need much, and it's still way less than you get in an actual Dorito. Bit of pepper. If you're feeling liberal, rainbow pepper. Mixed herbs. Da -da -da. Okay, Google, set a timer for six minutes. Okay, six minutes. Starting now. So this would be the first example where they're just super crispy. That's just on the edge of burn, but like... Now this is perfect. This is my life's greatest work. You could also add like some salsa. You could melt the cheese. You could do loads of creative things. But right now, I'm just actually really hungry. I just need to eat. Plant-based milks have to be more expensive than dairy milk. Now don't get me wrong, I love a bit of Oatly, but at £1.90 a litre, it hurts. So when I realised I already had a blender and I could make it myself at home in like literally six minutes, my mind was blown. Now, of course, obviously you do have to have the sunk cost of having some kind of very simple blender. The one that I had before this one I got from a charity shop for a tenner until I accidentally blew it up, but that's the story for another day. I was trying to make James and the Giant Peach peach juice. I, it was Every mistake is a lesson. <laughs> but if you already have some kind of food processor or blender in your life, this could save you some pennies. All you need is like three quarters of a cup of oats, five cups of water, half a teaspoon of vanilla essence, a little bit of salt, a little bit of cinnamon for some reason. Actually tastes quite good. Boom, oat milk for all occasions. And also a side order of overnight oats. Protein, you need lots of it. Watch out or you'll die. Turns out really hard to be protein deficient. Really hard. You'd actively have to put in a lot of effort to not get enough protein in your diet. Also, meat doesn't contain that much protein and if you decide you don't really want to eat it, you're probably already getting it from elsewhere without having to make up for it. The only reason that meat has any protein in it at all is because animals are eating plants. Another myth well marketed. Thanks adults. So I am a 30 year old not pregnant woman which means I need 47 grams of protein per day. Ideally. If I have peanut butter on toast for breakfast, hummus and falafel wrap for lunch, and maybe some soy mince in some kind of normal yummy evening meal, maybe shepherd's pie, I will have exceeded my intake of protein. Exceeded! That's not counting if I put milk replacement in my tea, maybe some nuts, a cereal bar, some greens on the side. Like, done. Like, absolutely done. If it's good enough for water buffalo, it's good enough for me. I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> anyway, scratch getting enough protein off your worry list, please. It's just not even worth the hassle. And now we come to the point that is inevitably gonna turn into uh, a Lena rant. Too late to go back now. Your BMI is a true reflection of your health and calories are a great way to measure that. Now, in the UK at least, you can't seem to have any medical conversation about food or weight without these three letters hanging over your head. B-M-I. 
it props up the majority of UK media stats on both obesity and anorexia as well as the official NHS reports about weight gain. Now while the NHS do put in the very small print that it's actually not that accurate at all and you probably shouldn't use it as a measurement, they, they do all the, all the time. Your BMI can be the difference between your GP telling you to eat more greens and come back next year, kind of slap on the wrist, or hospitalisation. It's pretty serious. For people in their 20s that struggle with extreme weight gain or extreme weight loss, it's often the main decider in their medical fate. Story time! When I was 14, I was diagnosed with PCOS, an unpleasant but very common condition, although I think it was quite rare to have it at 14, but whatever, that lets some cysts on your ovaries affect your ability to lose or gain weight. Among a cocktail of other really fun symptoms. The middle-aged male doctor simply stood me on the scales, popped me against a wall to measure my height, five foot two, pretty fucking short, did his merry maths and declared me fat. Very, very fat. Direct quote. Cue a decade of utter confusion about what I should be eating and how it was or wasn't affecting my weight. Now at this time I didn't know that doctors in the UK get between, I think it's 10 and 24 hours in total, over five or six years worth of education about nutrition. In the US it's 14 so have fun with that. But after that I had an understandable fear of keeping up with what my BMI was. But when I was about 24 I flicked open the official calculator on the NHS website, put in my weight, put in my height. Here's what it looked like on the day I did that and here was my result. At the time I thought sure without much knowledge of the body positivity movement or the fact that I shouldn't have to change my body for anyone I was like maybe I am a bit cuddly maybe I could stand to lose a little bit of weight but four stone even me then was like four stone just under a third of my body weight now they do emphasize that it is a guide and not a rule book however i am left wondering why we are encouraged to frame our relationships with our body and food around this number at all do you know why because the bmi scale or as they referred to it in 1835 when this research was being carried out yes 1835 the coetlet index sexier was only based on a sample of 100 and i quote Countrymen. Countrymen. There were no women included in this study and it is suggested that all the men were white. Furthermore, its inventor, Adolphe Quintetlet, warns within the paper that the very BMI scale is conceived that it is not intended for individual diagnosis at all. It was only proven to be useful to assess huge populations, not individual people. It is not intended to be used on one person. It's some really shitty maths. If there's one thing I wish I'd known in my early 20s before I was 24 was that it's completely irresponsible for the NHS to even be using that on their website and it should not be available for people to just play with like it's a Pokemon game. Furthermore, measuring what you put in your gob by calorie and not by all of the other nuanced nutritional values that your food might have in it is a recipe for unnecessary angst, really bad internal gut health and potentially if you get hung up on it, an eating disorder. I'm still reading up on it myself and I'm still learning more and when I do learn more I'll make more videos but what just shattered me was thinking about all the times I've been sitting in supermarkets and I pick the weird low-fat chemical ridden brownie that's like only 93 calories over the thing that has way more simple ingredients and no poisonous chemicals in it. I had no idea that almost all experts in the food field what I've got a food field, the food field. Imagine a food field, if you will. Think that the whole calories in, calories out measurement thing is absolutely absurd. The idea that it's as simple as an equation that's like the calories you put in should be equal to the calories you burn off. Like most people who actually study it think that's absolutely absurd. I don't know if you've been reading the news recently, but at the moment Boris thinks it'd be a great idea to make it mandatory for big restaurants to put the calorie counters on every single menu that you get when you're eating out which is incredibly triggering for all of the people who have been suffering with eating disorders which is a huge a huge part of the population and it also gives you a false sense of familiarity about what you might be eating and encourage restaurants to put more artificial processed stuff in their food than they already do so that they can drive the calorie counter down even though they're serving you things are way more likely to give you cancer Sorry, I don't want to stress you out, I just want you to know that if those calories appear on your menu that they tell you little to nothing about what you're actually eating. Oh, I'm so frustrated.
This um, top scientist in this book that I'm reading was talking about how outdated that is among like experts in the science community and he actually even compared it to climate denial. The actual experts think that the calories in calories out theory is as ridiculous and like tin paper hat as climate change denial. And lastly, the last lie we are told in our 20s. The volume you eat is a moral choice. It's not, it's just not. How much you put on your plate is not a reflection of how good or bad a person you are. Studies are showing more and more that your appetite is very much linked to the hormones that are in your body, your epigenetics, the kinds of ways your body has been conditioned to eat in the past, and 70% is influenced by your genes. Again, it's something that I'm still learning about, but I was absolutely fascinated at how much new research is really out there, especially for all those politicians that are setting guidelines for the whole country even though their parents paid loads for education but yet they seem unable to be able to listen to one audiobook about this i'm calm and i wondered to myself why i hadn't looked up any of the research or started learning earlier and it was really because of this last point because i thought that when i was over hungry and i was eating more than i thought i should be it was because i was a bad person it was because i was lazy and i was greedy not because we live in a capitalist society where we aren't given enough time or resources to look after ourselves or be able to afford food that doesn't essentially poison us food has been a real frenemy for me in my 20s i'm learning to be its friend forcing my friendship upon it. Those of you who have been here for a really long time will have seen my weight fluctuate on this channel quite openly and I really do believe that I am heading towards a healthier lifestyle and a more informed relationship with food but it's mad to me that we're not even really encouraged to do our own research about what we eat considering it's the thing we do at least three times a day, six times a day, eight times a day. I'm leaving some links to some cool podcasts and books that I've been looking at but let me know your recommendations in the comments below but just know that in your 20s you will be lied to about food and it's up to us to unpick that and make sure it doesn't come into our 30s. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the 20s toolkit. If you'd like to watch more episodes of it, you can find those here. This video was brought to you for free by The Gumption Club. They're the people behind this channel. They're the people that make this channel possible. If you'd like to be one of those people that makes these videos available for everybody, you can look into joining The Gumption Club below. What lies were you told in your 20s about food? I wanna hear in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time. Frog's bug out. Off to eat some donuts now.